Last week, <clears throat> I did a video lecture on sexuality, and on uh, re-listening to it, um, it occurred to me that, uh, like a lot of my talks, um, uh, a listener could well detect um, what they might call my heteronormative bias. Um, I think that's probably kind of inevitable for a heterosexual male of my generation. Um, I try to reduce my heterosexist bias as much as I possibly can. I think I've been pretty successful in doing that up to a point, but I would never claim to have been completely successful. Um, so there is a heteronormative bias. I frequently um, am talking about he and she and um, not any of the other possible combinations. Um, but uh, I want to say that one of the advantages of the view of sexuality I gave last week um, is that precisely because we are les animaux de nature, the denatured animal, uh, radically under-programmed biologically, uh, this means that there really is no normal. Uh, our sexuality is not biologically organized. Uh, and therefore, we can't really talk about the normal uh, or the abnormal uh, in any intrinsic sense. I mean, people are free to call whatever they want normal, and they're free to call whatever they want abnormal. But the point is that those judgments can't carry any natural or biological uh, objectivity. They are... Uh, social judgments, moral judgments. Um, they reflect the varying taste or the varying biases of the people who make the judgments. So um, we can't really speak about uh, heterosexuality as in any way uh, more normal than homosexuality or any other uh, form of sexuality, uh, we are free, according to the existentialists. Um, nature does not govern our behavior to a very large extent. Um, I, I then do not swing to social determinism. I mean, some people are so caught in the binary of nature and nurture, they, that they think that if we're not determined by nature, then we must be determined by nurture. And that is so simplistic. Um, it leaves entirely out of account the fact that we might be free, neither determined biologically nor entirely determined socially, but to some degree at least self-determining. Uh, in an earlier video, I asked people to imagine a pyramid, a triangle, and at the bottom we have nature, and at the other end we have nurture, and we have all of those positions in between that recognize both nature and nurture, but at the top of the pyramid, or the triangle, we have freedom. We have existentialism. We have the idea that, to some extent, human beings, with the acquisition of language, and the expansion of ego strength, uh, we are become capable of making decisions, making choices, uh, and shaping our, our own lives to varying degrees. Of course, all under the constraint of conditions that we have not chosen. Biological conditions, social conditions that we have not chosen, but as constrained as we are by these sets of conditions, according to existentialism, uh, we retain some small degree of freedom or agency, and hence responsibility, and hence anxiety, and hence guilt, and so on. So, um, 
So the advantage of the existential view is that as the denatured animal, we can't claim that any particular sexual organization is the natural organization for us. Now, I'm, I, I'm sure that people who are radically committed to heterosexuality will be scandalized by the idea that heterosexuality is not natural. But of course, these days, there are many people who are highly committed, say, to homosexuality or transsexuality who will be scandalized by the idea that their particular organization of sexuality is not natural. I'm saying there is no such thing as natural sexuality. These are human constructions shaped by the events of early childhood. Uh, no one knows how. Uh, we, we don't understand how, what are the exact conditions that cause um, uh, someone to become heterosexual any more than we know what causes someone to become homosexual uh, or bisexual uh, or transsexual. Uh, we have hypotheses, we have some ideas, but I don't think anyone can in any depth claim to have knowledge in this area, although for generations uh, Freudian psychoanalysts did claim to have knowledge uh, of the causes of what they viewed as the pathology of homosexuality. The field has taken uh, many decades to overcome that particular form of arrogance and that error. Okay, we're free to a considerable degree uh, and yet constrained by conditions not of our own choosing. Um, and we work out for ourselves some kind of sexual uh, organization. Uh, okay, well, given, given this view, what then can we mean by perversion? I mean, if there is no natural and proper form of sexuality for human beings, uh, given neither by God nor by nature, uh, on what basis can we call anything perverse? Um, well, I see two possible ways of answering this question. Um, the first is to uh, restrict the meaning of perverse to, uh, to the destructive uh, and to the false. Um, we often speak of a perversion of the truth. And there are lots of people who pervert the truth. Uh, the current president of the United States is a particularly good specimen of this. There are people who actually attempt to count and to keep up with the number of lies that pour forth from his mouth. Um, he is a major pervert when it comes to the idea of perversion of the truth. That's about all he does. Um, but uh, he's certainly not rare in that regard. So telling lies rather than the truth, and, and, and I would say telling lies to ourselves rather than the truth. Perverting the truth, denying the truth, evading the truth. I consider this to be a perversion. Uh, it's not perhaps a sexual perversion. It's a more general kind of perversion. Um, it is also a perversion to wish to hurt, harm, and destroy others. It is a perversion of our nature to be entirely or mainly hateful and have no capacity for love. It's a perversion of our nature not to care for others. Um, in this sense, narcissism is a perversion. Pathological narcissism is a perversion of our nature. It's, it's, it's a turning away from the other. It's a refusal 
of the capacity for concern. Uh, Self-concern obliterates any concern for the other. Again, the current president of the United States is a pretty good specimen of this. Uh, pathological narcissism as a type of perversion, a turning away from the need to care and the need to love. Of course, Freud pretty much said this himself in his way in 1914 when he said we must begin to love or we will fall ill and if we can't love we must fall ill. Um, okay, so that's another meaning for perversion, perversion of the truth. Uh, a perverse need to destroy rather than to create, a perverse need to hate instead of to love, uh, a perverse attraction to death as opposed to life. Um, I recently was moved by uh, an interview with Noam Chomsky. Don't entirely agree with him. He was urging everyone to vote for Biden as the lesser of two evils. I don't quite see how we consider, can consider Biden the lesser of two evils. Uh, currently, we're offered what appear to be two rapists, although uh, with Biden, that is an accusation. Uh, but I tend to believe Tara myself, but I admit that there may be some doubt um, that has yet to be fully investigated, I think. but. Um, uh, uh, Chomsky was urging us to vote for Biden because, because he made it clear he thinks that Trump is the leader of a death cult. That Trump is, is seeking to destroy human life on this planet, uh, canceling the, uh, uh, the nuclear treaty with Iran, um, refusing to renew various nuclear treaties, uh, utter disregard for anthropogenic climate disruption. This is a wanton disregard, at the very least, uh, for human life on this planet. At least a disregard, if not uh, a more or less unconscious uh, desire uh, to destroy life. Well, the great Eric Fromm distinguished biophilia, the love of life, from necrophilia, the love of death. There are people who love death and destruction more than life and construction. And that is a perversion. That is a perversion. So I don't speak of sexual perversion any longer because there's no standard by which to call anything uh, a sexual perversion, un unless it's a sexual form of destruction. I mean, if, 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 if you are out to destroy either the body or the soul of a child, as in child abuse, um, that is a perversion uh, because of its destructiveness. Uh, I personally can't see uh, uh, adults having sexual involvement with children is anything but destructive um, and therefore perverse. Uh, so so uh, perverse sexuality is, is perverse not intrinsically because of the sexuality, it's perverse because of the destructive nature of the sexuality, someone is being harmed, someone is being killed, someone is being violated. Um, many people consider rape not to be really sexual at all. It's all about violence and dominance and, and humiliation. It takes a semi-sexual form, obviously. Um, that, would be, that would be a sexual perversion because of the destructiveness, the violence, the hatred. Uh, the violation involved. That would be sexual perversion. Um, I'm thinking of the great book by Sergio Benvenuto, and um, somewhere in his book, uh, he indicates, 
because he works with a definition of perversion somewhat along these same lines. Um, prostitution is, is a perversion. Uh, I'm thinking not, well, I'm thinking both on the part of the prostitute and on the part of the customer. Um, because the sex worker has no genuine concern for the John, who is completely objectified. This is a, a commodification of the woman, or the man, the male prostitute, or the boy prostitute, or whatever. The, the prostitute is objectified and commodified, but the, the, the person who pays for the prostitute is also commodified, dehumanized. He's not a human being. He's simply uh, a cash machine. Um, both partners to the act of prostitution are commodified and objectified, and there is a violation of human care and concern there, which I would regard as perverse. So prostitution on both sides I consider uh, a perversion. Um, any form of exploitative sexuality uh, <laughs> male patients always find my attitude uh, peculiar. They are dating and uh, they're probably going to be having sex with this woman uh, and they're all shy and worried about performance issues and they think that they're very unmanly to be feeling shy. And my attitude is, listen, the sick guys are the guys who aren't at all shy. The sick guys are the ones who can jump into bed with anyone and perform uh, without a thought. Um, sex for them is dehumanized, depersonalized. What is it? It's like going to the gym or something. I mean, a healthy human being who for the first time gets naked with another human being, ought to feel shy, ought to feel self-conscious, ought to feel anxious. And some interference with sexual functioning should probably happen under those circumstances of anxiety and self-consciousness. What a sick culture. Maybe I could say a perverse culture that doesn't understand this and that thinks that sexual functioning should be like going for a jog or going for a workout at the gym. This is absurd. We're talking about human intimacy. Um, okay, so these are the meanings of, of perverse. Fundamentally destructiveness, hate dominant over love, death dominant over life, uh, lies dominant over truth. These are the true perversities. Um, but insofar as it's a man getting together with a man or a woman getting together with a woman or whatever combinations one wants to imagine, uh, these are not intrinsically perverse because there is no intrinsic normal for human sexuality because we are the denatured animal. But uh, surely there is a sense in which we want to talk about sexual pathology. Um, patients come for analysis. Uh, Men frequently come suffering from psychosexual impotence. <clears throat> I first ask them to go to the family doctor and have their hormone levels checked, not just testosterone, but also their estrogen levels. It turns out sometimes men can have normal testosterone, but can have very high estrogen, 
which can be treated, and when the estrogen level comes down, uh, suddenly they become, um, they become their erectile uh, dysfunction uh, or their psychosexual impotence um, disappears. So first you check out the hormonal levels involved. We do have bodies. We are denatured animals, but we still have bodies, and the body is involved in sexual functioning. But much more often, the erectile dysfunction, the impotence, is uh, caused by uh, other psychological and emotional factors. Uh, and these are, are, are many, and, and, and certainly too many to be listed here. It's very hard to generalize. Every case is, is different. As Freud said, uh, human behavior is overdetermined, multiple causes. Um, sometimes a man is impotent because he wants to deprive, unconsciously wants to deprive his wife of sex. Um, he wants her to want it, and he wants to deprive her of it, out of some unconscious hatred and revenge motive against the wife. So. Sometimes impotence is grounded in unconscious hostility, sometimes. Um, at other times, it's uh, grounded in a paralyzing self-consciousness. Uh, you know, self-consciousness blocks a lot of things. Try going to sleep because you have an early appointment the next morning and you wonder if you will fall asleep and having wondered whether you will, of course you won't. And the more you worry about not falling asleep, the more likely you are to remain awake. The more worried you are about whether or not you will get an erection, the more likely you are to not get an erection. Um, but this kind of worry is often grounded for men in um, a significant amount of castration anxiety. Um, getting it up is unconsciously understood by the man as some kind of crime, some kind of violation, perhaps an assault on the father or uh, the defeat of a brother. Um, and he's not allowed to be a winner. He must ensure that he's a loser. And sometimes it's not enough to do that in the occupational arena, but he may also have to do it in the bedroom. Uh, make sure that he is in a castrated position. Uh, that can be at the root of, of psychosexual impotence. Um, sometimes it's grounded in a terrible fear of the vagina. The vagina is fantasied as some kind of dangerous organ um, with something like glass or razor blades or teeth, the vagina dentata. If I put myself in there, I'll never get out, or I will come out mutilated. Um, and that, of course, can be grounded in many kinds of things. Uh, fantasy of an engulfing mother, a kind of entrapment, uh, a kind of revenge by the woman on the man, because unconsciously he's hating the woman, and therefore he expects to be hated back and revenge will take this mutilating form. I could go on and list a whole other series of possibilities. Analytic work, obviously, with, with men who, who have this problem requires uh, a lot of patient um, investigation um, to get at what are the particular factors that are operating unconsciously to bring about this symptom. Similarly with, uh, with women. Some women come to analysis because of a certain kind of frigidity. They've never ha been able to have any kind of orgasm whatsoever. Um, uh, other women are able to achieve orgasm, but only with the help of a lot of um, machinery of one kind or another. Um, intercourse with a man can only at best be a preliminary if they are to reach orgasm. The machines have to come out. Why is that? Again, uh, who knows? One would have to investigate. 
attitudes towards father? Were they abused in childhood? Um, is this forbidden? Is having sexual pleasure and fun a triumph over mother? Is it a surrender to father? What is it? Who knows? We have to find out. That's what psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic treatment is all about. Okay, so uh, we could go on with a long list of sexual dysfunctions. Uh, promiscuity, uh, what's that about? Safety in numbers. Uh, here's a guy who can't put all of his eggs in one basket. He's so afraid of being betrayed. Um, He has to be constantly proving his, quotes masculinity because unconsciously he has serious doubts about his masculinity. He becomes a great lover. But of course, he isn't a lover at all, really. He's a hater. He loves them and leaves them. In other words, he's committed to ditching them and hurting them. He's a hater, not a lover at all. A lot of promiscuity is is grounded in this kind of thing. Um, okay, this is not the place to try to string out a, a long list of sexual dysfunctions. Um, this is the work of not just a book, but uh, this is an encyclopedic uh, phenomenon. Um, there was a, another sense of, of perversion that I wanted to mention, and um, this has been put forward by a number of great psychoanalytic authors, uh, perhaps early on uh, by Robert Stoller in his wonderful little book called Perversion, The Erotic Form of Hatred. Masood Khan uh, contributed much to the understanding of perversion. Jacques Lacan contributed and most recently, Sergio Benvenuto pulled these, contrib uh, these contributions together in his book, What is Perversion? And without going into too much detail, the main point is, and Benvenuto points out, that many, many perverts, um, and now I'm using perversion in a different sense. I'm not talking about destruction. I'm not talking now about lies. I'm not talking now about death versus life. I'm talking about perversion as a form of creativity, as um, Benvenuto reports that many perverts consider their perversion a masterpiece, like an artistic masterpiece. And like all art, uh, it involves talent, artistry, uh, finesse, um, creativity, subtlety, uh, it's a bit of a high wire act involving the balancing of various ingredients. Um, we have all been traumatized in the Oedipal phase, if not also pre-Oedipally, but everybody has an Oedipus complex. <coughs> We all discover that we are not the one and only. Uh, we want to possess the love and the attention of the primary caretaker. But there are others. There is the other parent. There are brothers and sisters. Uh, we learn <clears throat> that we cannot always be the center of attention. We can't monopolize the love and attention. We can't always be the apple of the other's eye. Um, and the first recognition of this is painful. It's heartbreaking. Uh, so we are traumatized by the triangle, by the triad. Um, perversion is an attempted solution. It can be a poor attempt. It can be a failed attempt. Or it can be a pretty successful attempt um, of one kind or another to put a band-aid on this wound. 
uh, or to sublimate this wound, uh, to make something positive and fulfilling and even thrilling out of this woundedness. So, say these authors, for sexuality to be exciting, there must be risk. What is the risk? The risk is of being re-traumatized, of being the Oedipal, of, of re-experiencing the Oedipal trauma. Uh, one way of going about this is to try to work out a, a sexual drama in which this time you are an Oedipal winner, whereas as a child you were traumatized and feeling like the Oedipal loser, the excluded third. So you work out a, a sexual drama in which this time you are one of the two in the bedroom and you put someone else outside as the excluded third. Uh, you may flaunt your sexual fulfillment with your partner uh, and put the other in the position of the envious, um, aroused but frustrated, lacking other, the loser. There is an element of sadism um, in this, uh, making another person suffer. That's why Stoller calls perversion the erotic form of hatred. But sometimes this can be done playfully in a way that everyone kind of understands or half understands what's going on, their roles. Um, a mild form of this is a man uh, really enjoying walking into a party with his gorgeous, beautiful, sexy wife on his arm. And the other men are envious. And this strokes this man's ego and it stimulates him and it enhances his desire for his own partner because she is desired. Rene Girard went overboard on this idea that desire is mimetic. I come to desire something because other people desire it. There is some truth to that, although Girard, I think, overgeneralizes it, but there is truth in this. Um, uh, one's partner can seem even more desirable when one notices that other people desire him or her. Um, so that's one way to arrange this time to be the Oedipal winner. If, if, if one is masochistic, and I'm not calling that a perversion, but if that's one's game, one arranges to be the Oedipal loser again. Now, how can that possibly be healing to arrange to be re-traumatized again? Well, because a trauma that you arrange is very different than the original trauma, which you did not arrange. That original trauma happened to you through no choice and no stagecraft of your own. But this time, you've worked out a whole scenario in which, once again, it looks like you're the Oedipal loser, but not really because you set the whole thing up in the first place. And that makes all the difference. You're really the director of this play, occupying a masochistic position. Okay, um, there are a million ways that people engineer dramas, scenarios, in which there is risk, there is danger. The danger of re-traumatization is is narrowly averted. The whole thing is very exciting because it takes you back to the place of trauma. You make it work out much better this time. It's very stimulating. Um, and uh, uh, this can work if one can find a good accomplice. Benvenuto's term, an accomplice, uh, as I mentioned in the previous video, Bonnie and Clyde were accomplices in crime. We're talking here about accomplices in sexual, quotes, crime. Accomplices in a sexual drama, which is thrilling, risky, exciting. Um, what is playing with fire uh, in working out this kind of, quotes, perversion? Sublimations can break down. Uh, things can go awry. 
um, people can forget their lines or overstep their lines. Uh, people can forget the rules um, and the whole thing can become a disaster. Uh, on the other hand, um, done with artistry and restraint and balance, um, sometimes the result can be a fulfilling sex life that may extend over decades and may prevent a marriage from falling into that condition discussed in the last video, the condition of marital deadbed, which is all too prevalent. Okay. I think that's mostly what I wanted to add to the previous uh, video, and I would recommend Ben Venuto's book for those who want to go into all of this um, in greater depth and detail. Okay.